Let us stand this brother Abel. What child is this who's laid to rest on Mary's lap? You're sleeping. Angels greet with anthem sweet. Our shepherds walk on This is God's a king, the shepherds God and angels sing. Haste, haste to bring him out, the favorite son of Mary. So bring him in, since golden earth, a pleasant king to own him. But King of King, salvation bring that love and hearts enthroned him. This, this is Christ the King, who shepherds God and angels sing. Haste, haste to bring him out, the baby son of Mary. What child is this who's laid to rest on Mary's lap in sleeping? Who angels greet with anthem sing while shepherds watch on evening? This, this is Christ the King, who shepherds are and angels sing. To bring him love, the baby son of Mary. Mary, the baby son of Mary. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. We praise him Lord this morning. And there's no other like you, Lord. We just want to say, Lord, that we love you, Lord. Awesome call for you. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Holy, holy is he. Sing a new song to him who sits on heaven's mercy. With all creation I sing 
Obviously, today we're going to have Advent, first part of our Advent for the next coming month up until Christmas Eve. Um, so today is watch, uh, and then we'll have the hanging of the greens here in a little bit. Um, and then um, Wednesday, be normal, uh, family supper at 530 uh, till 630. Then we'll have the Bible study uh, for uh, youth and adults. Um, and do you, are you all still having handbells practice or just, okay, good deal. So having handbells practice at 730. Uh, so that's what's going on. Um, Thursday night, December 1st, will be the women's Bible study as well. So keep that in mind. I'm pretty sure they're coming close to the end of that uh, that study. Um, and then next Saturday is the men's breakfast also. So all men are welcome to that. Uh, that'll be at 8 o'clock. But if you want to show up sooner just to help out with cooking the breakfast and everything, that would be great as well. Um, and then pretty much for a good part of it, um, Wednesday, uh, everything else, if you look at your bulletin, you'll have the normal things. Uh, however, next Thursday, um, on the December 8th, will be the nutrition, nutrition class for the garden and everything else. So keep that in mind uh, in the next couple of weeks um, and as well. So that's pretty much all the announcements we got for the next couple of weeks. Um, and like I said, in a moment here, we'll, um, uh, Marilyn will come up. We'll, do the, we'll start the Advent service, which today is, is watch. Uh, then we have our guest speaker, Brother Jim Luby, is going to come up um, and give the message today as well. Um, and so, but while we're doing the Advent, we're not going to have children's church or the meet and greet. We'll just kind of get into, uh, once Advent's done, then we'll just kind of get into the message. And Brother Jim Luby will come on up and, and give us the word today. Uh, so if you'll just join me in prayer uh, real quick, and then Marilyn will come up. Lord, Father God, uh, we just thank you for this morning, Father God. We thank you for the cooler weather that you've given us. We thank you for the blessing of the rain that we've had. And Father God, for this past week and, and the time that we got to spend with, with friends and family over the holiday of uh, Thanksgiving, Father God. Um, we just thank you for that. We thank you for all the food and the blessing that you had of that. Some of us maybe had too much food, but uh, still what a blessing it is, Father God, just to, to share in the experience uh, just with our friend or with our loved ones, Lord. Uh, but more importantly, as we just approach this time, um, to give thanks that you've all that you've done for us, Father God, for your son Jesus and, and how the Holy Spirit and, 
how you all work together just to encourage us and empower us and strengthen us, Father God. Uh, but more importantly, Lord, um, the blessing of your son, Jesus, and, and the thanks that we have for that and the salvation that we receive from him. And so, Father God, as we approach this time and this season and as we prepare for the Advent, Lord, um, as, as today is the, the idea of watch and the theme of it and just how we need to be watchful of ourselves, watchful of our brothers and sisters, watchful of our community, Lord, Father God, that we are uh, mindful of these things, Lord, that we are mindful of, of, of what we are doing and how we are living and how our lives should, should glorify you, Father God, and that we are mindful of this time and this season as we prepare our hearts, our minds, and our spirits for um, the birth of your son, Jesus, in this time and this season as which we celebrate that, Father God. So Lord, as we are here this morning to prepare, um, just be with us. Be with Brother Luby this morning as he delivers the word and message. Pray that our hearts, our minds, and our spirits are open to what he has in store for us um, and how he'll, he'll be your, your tool piece and his mouthpiece for him, for, uh, for you, Father God. And so Lord, we just thank you for that. We thank you for um, those that have been practicing so diligently over the last several months for the handbells. And we pray that this is a, a good and joyous service and, uh, as well and everything else, Lord God. And, and we thank you and love you in Jesus' name we pray. also intertwined with evergreen and the poinsettias and our Christmas tree, which you see lighted over in the corner there. Um, traditionally, the Christmas are, are uh, ornaments that are representing different Christian symbols and they, um, we went ahead and decorated the tree partly, but we're going to ask the church family to uh, finish decorating it, and the children will help with that. Um, this tree also represents a reminder of Jesus' birth, and also to remind us to be watchful for the second coming. It's not uh, all just about the birth. The nativity scene is placed here to remind us of Jesus' birth and the wise men and the shepherds all alike coming together and the angel announcing. Now, these are special items. These were made by uh, women in the church in uh, the 80s. And the Christmas also were handmade by the women in the church. And we have saved them and we add it to our church family tradition. We, have, we want to remind ourselves that um, things from the past are important to add with the future and to hold it together as a book of a journey. And that's what we have here. So the candles themselves, are uh, they shine brightly in the midst of darkness. They symbolize and remind us that Jesus came as light into a dark world. And I think especially at this time of the year, uh, in our situation, in our country and world, uh, this is a wonderful reminder of, of the light of Jesus in a very dark world right now. So I'm going to read the, the first Advent readings. Each, each uh, Sunday, we have a different reading and a different uh, representative will read. And I'm at, actually representing the McKaig family reading. Uh, my husband would be here to do that, but he's too ill. And so I, I hope I can do him honor. So <clears throat> this is from Matthew 1, 20 to 23. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. And then from Luke 2, 4 through 7, so Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to their firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. 
So this Advent Sunday is watch. Advent is a time of preparation and patience. The meaning and joy of Christmas cannot be grasped hurriedly. The wisdom of Advent is that it gives us the time we need to prepare ourselves and to grow into the joy of Christmas. May our church family be a haven of calm during this Advent season, and may God's loving light glow in our heart day by day as we watch, prepare, rejoice, and behold our Savior. O oh Lord, keep us awake and alert, watching for your kingdom. Make us strong in faith so we may greet your son when he comes and joyfully give him praise with you and with the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, I would like to invite you all to come. Uh, those of you that are going to go hold the basket and help Natalie and Anna, and would you go and hold the basket? They're going to assist you. Each one, go ahead and get a... Uh, Chris Mon and hang it on the tree. Thank you. And enjoying getting to hear that and enjoy getting to be a part of the traditions that are here. And it's interesting that that's what's leading to this moment because that's part of what we're going to talk about today with traditions and legacy. So I'd invite you, if you have your Bibles, to turn to Ezekiel. When's the last time you heard a sermon out of Ezekiel? We're going to look at Ezekiel chapter 37 and part of the prophecy that God gave at this time to Israel. Because in this prophecy, we see that there is a call and a promise of revival. Now, we often talk about revival. We often see that there are signs of things happening that we call revival. But we don't always necessarily understand what it takes and what it is. So as we study God's word today, we want to talk about that. Now, the first thing that we have to understand is that there is a lineage of faith within a church that is only and always based in an ongoing relationship with the Lord. Because if there is a connection to the past, if there is a connection with the accomplishments that we have seen in the spiritual life of a church, we have to understand that it has to be grounded in the Word of God, and it has to be led by the Holy Spirit. Because if it is led by any other purpose, any other means, it will fall short it will not lead to revival. If it's based in human work, it doesn't have that faithful undergirding of what God is doing. Now, that may seem like a strange introduction, but I believe it's important in this season of Thanksgiving. Because we do give thanks and we understand that all of this comes from God. And when we recognize that first, we are given to a spirit of thanks. We are going to give thanks because we recognize from whom it comes. Four years ago, this month, one of my sons and I made a trip back to a previous pastorate in central Texas. And it was an exciting trip for me because our church there had completed a construction project that had, when it actually began, taken only about a year and a half but there had been nearly 20 years of planning and 20 years of, frankly, inaction. And during that time I led that church, I was very frustrated by this because you could come to that church and it looked like half a church. You could see the front half. The front half was beautiful and then it just cut off and there was all this open space. And when I came into the church, they said, oh yes, we're in the middle of this great building program. 
Well, later when I got there, I realized they had been working on this great building program for more than 15 years. We had young men and women who had been toddlers who were now adults in the church. And I said, wait a minute, something's missing here. And I would go to meetings, and I used to joke that some of our business meetings were like going to a horse's stable because it was all long faces and nays. Some of y'all will get that on the way home, too. And it was very frustrating. I was a very young pastor, and I was still learning many things. I was still in seminary and trying to understand what was happening or what wasn't happening there. But to come back and see that church alive, to see the construction finished, and not just the building itself, but see the life that was filling it, reminded me of this particular passage. And one particular day was something the Lord gave me in that. So if I can be bold this morning, I have prayerfully considered for community of faith today, there is a message in this, one of caution and hope that I hope to bring to you this morning. Now, I share some of these details with you about a previous pastorate because I believe they may have some bearing on where this fellowship is and where God's taking it in the future. My time at that church was in a very t a small town called Santo. Now, I would be very surprised if anybody in here has ever been to Santo or seen Santo. It is a wide spot in the road, literally, somewhere between Mineral Wells and Stephenville, Texas, to give you some perspective. 30 minutes from a Walmart in any direction. So very rural, very small community, beautiful town, though. And I'd had several connections to that church's past. I had been friends with the music minister. I had been friends with the previous pastor who had been there when the church was really moving, when they would see hundreds on a Sunday morning. Well, I got there, and we saw tens. And I said, something's happened. Something along this time has changed. Now, the good news is I didn't come into that church completely blind. Because I had that connection with their past, I was able to talk to some of the previous pastors and see some of the decisions along the way that had led to that point, some of the frustrations. And some churches never get that benefit because it seems often in Baptist churches, at least, we, we tend to trade pastors about every two or three years. And it's very difficult to build any kind of legacy, so we weren't starting from scratch. I drew up notes and made phone calls with the folks that were there before me and left things for those who followed me so that there was a legacy in the leadership. One of my personal areas of study, of interest, that uh, started even before I was in seminary is the concept of awakenings and revivals. Sometimes we think they're the same thing. Well, no. You must first be awakened before you can be revived. You must be first alive in Christ before you can be made alive in Christ again. So in particular, revivals are fascinating to me because we see sometimes that we can stray from what God has in mind. We can move away from what God has put before us. We can, frankly, just be disobedient. And that's really what it comes down to. And that's a very frustrating place to be because it's personally humiliating to us. It's very frustrating. What do you mean I'm off the course? Well, if we read God's word and we see that our life does not match up with the prescription God has given us, well, that's sin. And God makes that very plain. And it is often embarrassing. It's often frustrating. Often we sound like little children. What do you mean I can't have it the way I want it when I want it right now? You ever notice how often Paul refers to us as little children? Perhaps he saw that as well. But as I study this idea of revivals, part of the difficulty we have in churches is when we say revival, we tend to think of a concept, particularly in our Baptist stream of churches and those that are like-minded with us. We have this idea of bringing in a dynamic evangelist and having some extra services and if we're really lucky, an ice cream social on the last night. That's what many of us think of when we hear the word revival. And like the word fellowship, we need to understand it's not about the food. That's just the situation where the spiritual activity can happen. 
We hold those revivals in the hopes that God will bless it, that there will be meaningful movement in people's lives, that there will be confession and repentance, and praise God, salvation. And truthfully, revivals are hard to accomplish in our day with our busy schedules and being pulled in so many directions. When I was at that church in Santo, I realized that I had fallen very quickly into the same sort of spiritual malaise, a sort of spiritual depression that was present in that church. And I was seeing things with my sight rather than faith. And that's very easy to do. We can be consumed with low numbers. We can be consumed with a lack of urgency in evangelism. We can be depressed by a dry baptistry and say, it's been so long, God, since we've seen a movement of your spirit. Have you forsaken us? It can be spiritually defeating if we begin to give in to that kind of thinking and measure by only human standards. Have you ever noticed there's a difference in the Bible from how we speak? If we're thinking of opposites, if I were to go up to most people and say, what's the opposite of faith? They're going to say, disbelief or doubt. And that's not what's described in the Word. You will see over and over, and the Apostle Paul in particular is very good about this. He says that it is not the opposite of faith that is doubt. It is sight. It is relying upon our human measures, relying upon our human sight, rather than seeing through the eyes of the Spirit what God is doing. Because when God shows up, he shows up in unmistakable, overwhelming ways, miraculous ways. When the undeniable meets the unexplainable, and we see God at work. So let me give testimony to what God did. God used a song. I'm a musician. I like to play. I enjoy music. And I had bought a Chris Tomlin album. It was on sale that week. And I said, okay, we'll throw it in the CD player. I'm listening to it, and there was a particular song called Awake My Soul. The years since, I've sung it many times in some of the praise bands in our churches. But the first time I heard it, it surprised me. Because in the middle of this, where you might have a guitar solo or some instrumental, suddenly a rapper named Lecrae comes in, and he has a very loud voice. And it, it shook me. It surprised me. And instead of rapping, he began to read the passage that we're going to study today. And it shook me. It surprised me. He grabbed me with the passion and how he delivered it. And I can remember driving along Farm to Market Road 4, I had to pull over as I listened to this because it also broke me. Now, I'm not one given to crying. I feel emotions very deeply, but I've just, you know, some of y'all are planted by the water. I'm in the dry desert. I cried that day. I wept that day on the side of the road because I recognized that I was in that place, that valley of dry bones when it came to my faith. And I began to cry, and then I cried out to God to forgive me because I recognized that I was in sin. I recognized personally and in my leadership of the church to which I was entrusted that I was relying on sight. I was relying on my own power, my own thought of leadership rather than trusting in the word and God's purpose for his redeemed. So my hope today as we read the scripture is that we hear the call to a faithful trust in our God and the faithful trust he gives his beloved redeemed, his church, and the purpose of that calling. So if you have your Bibles, let's read together. It'll be on the screen on either side as well if you don't. Ezekiel 37, beginning with verse 1. Ezekiel writes, the hand of the Lord was on me, and he brought me out by his spirit and set me down in the middle of the valley. It was full of bones. He led me all around them. There were a great many of them on the surface of the valley, and they were very dry. Then he said to me, son of man, can these bones live? 
I replied, Lord God, only you know. He said to me, prophesy concerning these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Lord God says to these bones. I will cause breath to enter you and you will live. I will put tendons on you, make flesh grow on you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you so that you come to life. Then you will know I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I had been commanded. While I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together bone on bone. As I looked, tendons appeared on them. Flesh grew and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. He said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, say to it, this is what the Lord God says. Breath come from the four winds and breathe into these slain so they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me. The breath entered them, and they came to life and stood on their feet, a vast army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Look how they say, our bones are dried up and our hope is perished. We're cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, this is what the Lord God says. I'm going to open up your graves and bring you up from them, my people, and lead you into the land of Israel. You will know that I am the Lord, my people, when I open your graves and bring you up from them. I will put my spirit in you, and you will live, and I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know I am the Lord. I have spoken, and I will do it. This is the declaration of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we come together today for the purpose of hearing your word of understanding it, Lord, and we pray that you would open our hearts to the understanding. Lord, that we would hear and understand that you are still in the business of bringing life, and only you bring life eternal. That you have given us Jesus, that you have given us the example, that you preserve us in your word and your spirit so that we may understand your purposes and may understand the work you have called us to, individually, together, and Lord, may we be present and found in it. Thank you for your word, God. Thank you for the understanding of it. May you speak through it today. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So as I mentioned a moment ago, I love to study revivals. And one of the things that I have found in common in every single great revival is it is always preceded by two things. Confession and repentance. And before those two things, there's prayer. And before that, it is a study of the word. But when we see the confession and repentance, that's sort of like the eruption of a great mountain. You begin to see the smoke. You begin to see the power coming from it. There's a great rumbling that happens before. There's a great movement that happens before, but it's not visible. But when that confession and repentance begins you start to see it take hold. And this has been present in every historically recorded revival. It is present in all of the revival that we see throughout God's Word. So that would lead me to believe, sometimes I get things, that would lead me to believe that confession and repentance must be present before there will be spiritual revival. In 1995, I was living in Brownwood, Texas. I was a student at Howard Payne University. And there was a church there, Coggan Avenue Baptist Church. And a great revival began at this church. And it was somewhat unexpected by the church. Oh, they'd been praying. They had had cottage prayer groups that had been meeting in homes for years leading up to it. And this revival sprung out. and It didn't happen during a special week of revival services. There was Nothing in particularly special about the message that had been delivered that morning by the pastor. But it began with a student. And a student read Joel 2.12. Even now, this is the Lord's declaration. Turn to me with all your heart, with fasting, weeping, and mourning. And the student gave testimony. And that testimony included confession. And what followed after that was two more students. Two more students came forward to confess their sins, 
to repent and to pray. And then four more followed. And then more followed. Other churches were letting out and students were coming to that particular church and participating in this. It went on well into the evening. I wasn't there, but my best friend was. Now, let me describe what we were like back then. We were, quote unquote, good kids. We grew up in Christian homes, but neither one of us were model Christians at that time. But we were living as uh, what we could term practical atheists. We were saying we knew all about God, but we weren't walking in his authority. We weren't walking in what he had put before us. We were just sort of going our own way as long as we didn't, uh, you know, smoke cigarettes or cuss too much or anything like that. We were good kids. We were moral, but we were not saved. After that particular Sunday, I saw a tremendous change in my friend. And when I talk about an overnight change, I mean an overnight change. He was different. A few weeks later at a weekly chapel service at Howard Payne, I remember coming to the altar to pray. And that was unusual for the chapels. We didn't usually get especially religious. It would be more of a a group assembly. That chapel lasted four hours. It was supposed to last 45 minutes. Now, I didn't usually come forward to the altar to pray. I always thought that was a little corny. But there I was. And I remember asking God, what are you doing here? What's happening here? I remember the Spirit of God and sensing that he was speaking to me. And I remember being broken over my own sin, broken with weeping, and it eventually led to my coming forward to be baptized. And I knew with all my being, all of who I was, that Christ had saved me. It was different. And others saw the change. People I worked with out in the community, people I knew there, they're like, what's going on, Luby? You're not even the same guy. It's a tremendous change. My life, my speech, my actions, even my passions. That revival that was happening there in Brownwood carried on to Southwestern Seminary in Fort Worth. This went on for weeks and weeks and weeks. From there, it went to more than 100 college campuses. From there, it spread to Europe. From there, it spread to Russia. Today, there are still mission trips that go from this church to Moscow several times a year. And there are literally thousands who have come to know Jesus Christ as their Savior because of this. There are literally untold thousands that are doing exactly what I'm doing right now. I think back to all of the men that lived on my floor of the dorm. And it was interesting because most of us were not religious education majors. We weren't practical theology majors. But I look at that and every single one of us on that floor are preaching somewhere. That was unusual. That was something special that was going on. But to see the gospel spread into places that were unexpected, Most of us grew up thinking of Russia as the evil empire, those godless Soviets. There was still a seed of faith in that place during all that time. That place was not forsaken in the way that we might have thought it was. And to see revival coming amongst those who were desperate and hungry is tremendous. And friends, to see that even now it affects things that are going on in this world. You may look at things in the news and say, oh, terrible, terrible. That could be the end of everything that's going on right now. I don't think so. Because there is still a faithful remnant there that is praying, that is working, that is prophesying, that is preaching, that is leading others to repentance, 
through confession, through prayer, through understanding of God's word in a way that wouldn't have been possible 30 years ago because God knows what's needed. Revival erupting in places that just a few years before had been so repressive that the word of God could not be heard. We have to be very careful to evaluate. Are we in the valley of dry bones? Are we looking around and all we see are dry bones? There's no hope. This world's a mess. Unredeemable. We'll be careful. That's not ours to pronounce. Our job as the faithful redeemed is to continue to look forward in the eyes of faith, to continue to pray for what God has in mind, to continue to trust that he's done it before, he will do it again, and that this purpose is what the church is to be about. We have to ask, are we professing a kind of godliness but are we denying its power? That's a hard question, isn't it? It's one that should cause us reflection. We need to continually reflect on that because it's very easy to get into routines. It's very easy to get along with programs and procedures and ways that we've always done things, and we can miss the work that God has in mind right here for each one of us. Here's what we learn from the Valley of Dry Bones. The first thing we see in the first six verses is that revival is from God. It is not a man-made event. There is no action of man that can cause revival. Only God can do so. In this time that God is speaking to Ezekiel, he is demonstrating his authority. Throughout this, we see that God was commanding, 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 commanding. If we have issue with God commanding us, we need to evaluate our hearts. If it causes us to bow up toward God, we need to remember who we are and who he is. Because he is commanding here, we understand that real, lasting, productive spiritual revival is not man-made. It was the hand of God that was on Ezekiel. We see from the scripture that God will use us to accomplish his purpose. But we must, we must always be mindful it is a work of God through us not of us. We have to acknowledge where the power is. Ezekiel sees the valley of dry bones, and we can see from the scripture he's overwhelmed by it. He looks at it and says, this is desolation. There is nothing living here, and it's been that way a long time. Those bones are bleached. They're brittle. There is no life in them. And he's apparently depressed by this. He's overwhelmed, but the good news is he remembers who it is he's talking to. He understands that. The question God asks him, can these bones live? God asks. Zeke didn't say, no way. Ain't going to happen, God. Can't be done. Life is gone. He answers faithfully, Lord God, only you know. Only you know. He remembers who has the power in all of this. Now, God works through the faithful, those willing to follow, those willing to acknowledge the power and authority of our God, who he is in his perfection, and that we are not he. And then God uses him. He says, prophesy. Sometimes we get nervous with that word, don't we? Prophesy. Well, wait a minute, what's going on here? Are we looking into the future? What? Ooh, that seems a little strange. I don't understand that. God commands him to prophesy. Let's understand that word. It's a very ancient Hebrew word. And it means more than just speak. It means more than just get up and preach and talk. It means to do something very, very specific. It means to speak under the influence of God. Speak with my voice. Do not speak your words, your power. Speak my words and my power. He commands Ezekiel to do this. Now, Ezekiel doesn't walk in and say, I'm speaking with the word of God right here. Here comes the power. 
He is commanded first by God. Church, we have to have ears to ear. No number of programs, people, or positions will bring about revival without the power of God first at work. But God will use the faithful to bring about his work for his glory. He will do that. He will say, you're willing to do what I've called you to do in the way I've called you to do it? Let's go. Let's go. And real revival, real spiritual revival, measured by God's word, empowered in the Holy Spirit, bringing about those folks who are lost to life, bringing about redemption, rekindling the faith of those who are looking with their sight. That's the second thing we see, verses 7 to 10. Revival brings new life. These bones had been alive before. That was clear. A great many had been alive before. But they were dead. There was no life. Ezekiel followed the command of God. And we can read that it was God's power at work in him. But we have to understand why God does this. And this is a word we sometimes have trouble with. It is for his glory. He does it to demonstrate his authority. He does it to demonstrate his power. He does it to demonstrate that he is God, we are not. For all our knowledge, we still can't bring about life. We still can't truly create. Everything that we create is created out of something else. God speaks it. God speaks the word. He speaks the life. Now, I don't know where you're from, but that's power. That is authority in here. But here's the truth of God. Confirmed description over and over and over whether the revival is a vast valley of dry bones or the revival of a church or even the revival of you personally in your spiritual life, it is a work of God. We can't think ourselves into it. We can't lift ourselves up into it. That's not of our power. It's only the power of God. And God demonstrates his power at work in your life. Why? Why does God do this? God does this to demonstrate who he is. God does it to demonstrate his redeeming power. God does it to demonstrate that he alone can make this kind of difference. I saw this in my own life. People were stepping back going, you're different. Something's different about you. One of my coworkers said, you're glowing. And God gets the glory. God gets the glory. God does this so that we have testimony, just like I'm giving you today, so that we can be faithful in this. There's a great Greek word, martus. It means to witness. We get our word martyr from it. Now, we often think that that means, well, I got to die, and there might be lions involved. But if we look spiritually at what God commands us, yes, we are called to die. What was old is useless. What was old did not bring about life. What was old did not bring about glory for God. We give glory to God in our actions in this new life. So we can tell others, this is what Jesus Christ has done for me. Let's talk about your testimony. I shared this with you before. People get scared to pieces when they say, what's your testimony? And I love it because I'll hear people say, well, when I was six years old, I was saved and baptized, and I'm talking to somebody in their 70s. That's like somebody saying, Jim, tell us about your life. Well, I was born at a very young age. Great. In the meantime, what else has happened? If you are walking in the Spirit, you are going to have an ongoing testimony. 
is not just about what God did, it's what God's doing and the understanding of what he is going to do in his ongoing, everlasting, unchanging faithfulness. That's the life that God brings about. Let's talk about your testimony for a second. People get scared of giving their testimony. It's real simple, three parts. Here's who I was and the mess I was in before I knew Jesus. Second part, here's how I met Jesus. And the third part, and here's who I am and what my future holds because of Jesus. Do you hear what's common in all three of those? Jesus because it's his testimony, his testimony of faithfulness in our lives. That's all you need to do. Next time somebody says, what's your testimony? That's it, three parts. Who I was, how I came to know him, and who I am. God does this for his glory. Have you ever noticed throughout God's word, there's a consistent thing he loves to do. He loves to take people who are unknown, I mean, if you look at the disciples, friends, if you don't take a lot of encouragement from the disciples, you're not reading closely enough. Oh, I love these guys. They were a hot mess. They were a hot mess because they often tried to rely on their sight. Even though they were in the physical presence of Jesus, the only son of God, that they were seeing the demonstration of his authority and power as God, they would still try to do it out of their own power. They would still sit there and doubt. So if you have doubt, that's okay. Give yourselves a little credit. So did all those guys. But also understanding that they were relying on their sight. But they weren't anything special, were they? They weren't. They were just everyday folks. And God chose those everyday folks to carry that message out into the world that has changed everything. I often talk with my students as I'm teaching through different books of the Bible that they don't even realize how much of their life has been shaped by things that happened 2,000 years ago. How much of our society, how much of how we approach the world is changed by what God has done because they're swimming in it. They don't even recognize it like fish in the water. Fish don't recognize the water only when it's gone. Likewise, we often don't recognize how blessed we are until those blessings are gone. God loves to use normal folks, folks that were no importance by worldly standards, and use that to bring about his message. I think probably the most well-known evangelist in our lifetime was Billy Graham. If you look at Billy Graham... There was nothing particularly special about him. He was a a fellow from North Carolina, had an unusual voice. And God used that voice because he was willing to bring untold millions to a saving redemption in Jesus Christ. Now, as Billy said, if he can use a fellow from the woods of North Carolina to do that, we have no excuse. Look at the third thing we see. Because revival shows God's majesty. His majesty. Verses 11 through 14 talk about his authority. Not only as our creator, but as our leader, as our God. It is majestic. We don't use that word very often in our society. But understand when we do, we are reserving it for something that is overwhelmingly powerful, overwhelmingly beautiful that causes us to awe in its power. God will do this. I look at what God did with that revival that started at Coggan Avenue Baptist Church. It has affected literally millions of people by now. It is ongoing. When we see that God is is at work, make no mistake about it, we will recognize that it is he who is at work. We could try to conjure up some great crusade. We could try to fill some stadium. If it is not a work of God, it will not bring about 
spiritual revival. <clears throat> One thing that stood out to me all those years ago, when I heard the pastor from Coggan Avenue Baptist Church, one thing that stood out to me is he was always humble about his role. In some ways, he reminded me of like a first responder. You ask a first responder, you know, why did you run into the burning house? Well, that's just what we do. That's the job. Brother John was like that. He said, this is what God's doing. I just had the blessing of getting to see it. I got to be here when it happened. He led his church for many years in prayer before this particular event happened. He could have bragged about it. It was under his watch. It was during his leadership. But he didn't. He still doesn't. God did the real work. We just have to be faithful. So what do we carry away from this passage and this testimony? Friends, I saw a revival happen at a church I was at that I pastored that frankly started with my own confession and repentance. That pastor, John Avant, he listed three lessons that he learned during that special time of focused work that God was accomplishing. The first, he said, recognize God's presence every moment of the day. This is not just Sunday and Wednesday. Every moment of the day. He said, people you meet at the gas station, that could be a life-changing moment. I've had this annoying habit for years of sitting there and talking with everybody I meet. I am not the guy you want to sit next to on an airplane. I'm just not. When I came to know the Lord and, and made that profession in 1996, the very next week I was on a flight. I looked at the guy next to me and said, what do you think happens to us when we die? Not the question to ask somebody on a flight. It was a different time. Recognize that these interactions could not be only life-changing, but for that person could be eternity-changing. You are called to walk as a herald of the king. You are an ambassador for an unfailing kingdom. Keep that in mind. Second, remember the power of one person who is willing to be part of a praying remnant that helps bring revival. It takes one. God can use that. And then finally, understand that realizing the power of humility and repentance in daily life matters. See, we can start to get very proud of ourselves saying, gosh, I'm living so good. What a good boy am I. Doing great. Lord, look at all this faithfulness. All of that faithfulness means nothing if in this day we are not being faithful because that's in the past. 